Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another session during Confetti's Industry Week. Uh, can we have a round of applause, please? I'm, I'm really hoping that the chat is now just flooding, you know, with, with clapping and everything, just to, just to keep it going. Um, I'd like you to introduce uh, Julia for you um, this afternoon, uh, who will be talking to you about her experiences working within the games industry, managing a brand, and also how she's been able to keep herself productive throughout our current climate. Uh, please use the Q&A functionality within Zoom if any of you have got any questions that you'd like to ask Julia throughout today's session, and we, of course, will answer those at an appropriate time. Please do keep the overall chat, however, to a minimum. We, of course, hope that you enjoy today's session uh, and take away a number of points from within it as well. Uh, firstly, though, I do want to thank Julia uh, for taking the time out of her busy schedule today to join us for, once again, Confetti's 50th uh, not 50th, 15th uh, industry week throughout. Not very good with the whole nerves sort of thing on the front of it. So uh, don't forget that you can continue to book into additional events all the way as we move through the week by visiting iw.confetti.ac.uk and using your Confetti or NTU email address. Uh, all throughout the week we are running a competition on Instagram in which you can get involved and once again on Twitter as well by using the hashtag IW21 sharing, you, sharing your experiences throughout the week. Uh, of course I could carry on talking throughout but I'm sure you don't want that so of course I want to pass over to Julia. Over to you. Thank you very much. Hi, hello everybody. Actually before I get into talk Chris, right, okay, um, I have some top advice actually. Um, what I found more and more with presenting is that when I first started, um, like no one, like it was a sort of quite a niche sort of skill set. No one really needed to do it. But actually, what I realize now is that everyone needs to know, like, do live talks, do pitches, presentations, all this different stuff, which always raises up the question of, and I don't particularly like it, which is, uh, you just sort of get used to it, which is uh, to, uh, you know, calm your nerves when you've got to do uh, like a bit of a speech or an introduction, can I give you some top tips, Chris? Feel free, feel free. Okay. If, if, if it's whiskey, then, you know, we're, we're all good on that. Part. I mean, whiskey does potentially solve, but then you end up just saying something really stupid later on, like once you've got past the first like initial bit that was scary. So it's kind of pluses and minuses. Uh, one of the best bits of advice I can give anyone, and this is not just about presenting or pitching, it's just in life in general. You know, sometimes when you're just so terrified that there's too much adrenaline and it just makes you like, like mumble and like it stutter through what you're, what you're trying to do and what you want to do is get that kind of sweet spot where um you have a little bit of adrenaline just enough to make your brain run a bit quicker but not too much that it kind of pushes you over the edge um so the best bit of advice i could give everybody would be uh breathing these breathing techniques so you've probably done some maybe like in meditations and things like that before and there's a couple of different ways you can do it um the one that i like to do though is uh it's it's you basically breathe in for four so you do like a slow breath in for four like one two three four then you hold it for one and then you breathe out for eight and then you hold it for one so basically it's in for four hold for one out for eight hold for one and you'll do it and anytime i've had to go on stage and i've been absolutely bricking it like i'm talking like shaky hands so much adrenaline um if i do that i'll, I'll do it and while i'm doing it, i'm like this is not going to work it's never going to work. Why would it work? If I do it for 30 seconds before uh, I do something that I'm terrified of, it you what you don't realize at the time is like your heart rate is phenomenally increased, which means that you just you think you don't have enough time because your brain's moving so quickly. And when you want to talk, you want to speak slowly and clearly and having lots of adrenaline tends to make you speak really, really fast. So if you do that before you do anything, after about 30 seconds, you'll suddenly realize that you feel quite calm. And then as soon as you realize you have all the time in the world to say what you want, suddenly you kind of sit and ease into whatever it is you're about to do and, and everything just flows so much easier. Sorry, I thought I'd, I thought I'd share. It's like a use, hopefully a little bit all, of useful advice. I'm sure valuable <laughs> insight for the students as well. <laughs> cool, okay. Well, I suppose I should um, talk about stuff, I guess. Um, so um, uh, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Julia Hardy. I have been a freelance uh, presenter for over 10 years now, probably longer than that. Uh, I've mainly kind of specialized in um, uh, video games. I have done, I, I originally started in music TV and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, but I've been doing it for an incredibly long time. Uh, I've done a bunch of TV 
TV stuff, radio, podcasts, like a bit of everything. I've worked for, uh, wait, let me remember things. Um, I've done a lot of work for uh, the BBC, for Xbox, uh, for PlayStation, uh, for BAFTA, uh, for a whole host of different, you know, sort of big organizations. I used to do a video game show on Bravo. I did one on Challenge. I've like, I've done a lot of different stuff. I've done Radio 1, BBC Radio 1, whatever a whole load of different stuff over my career so uh I've kind of seen it all I feel tended this like weird old lady who's like yeah I've seen everything in my term um so I've seen lots of different changes in the industry and I've worked in a lot of different uh places uh doing lots of different types of work as well so I feel like I've quite got a good fairly good perspective of kind of what's happening and what's kind of been happening uh over the years um it's been a very interesting career choice uh, I originally studied photography and uh, still, I don't think I've paid that back yet. I was kind of hoping maybe I'd just like move abroad or whatever, it'd be fine. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I've been doing this like a, a really, really long time. And uh, obviously being a woman within a, a predominantly kind of male dominated industry, although that is switching and changing now, it's been an uh, interesting journey um, to, you know, kind of get to this point. And as you can imagine, you know, as you, are, you guys are kind of like starting out, um, you know, if you are a female in the industry, you can kind of uh, sort of see some of the uh, issues that um, happen within the uh, within the industry. And let me tell you, like, as much as it's still a little bit terrible now, it was significantly much worse before. Um, so way back in the day, when I first kind of got into video game stuff, there was myself uh, and maybe like four other women who did kind of well, like kind of writing or on camera stuff. So myself, uh, Jane Douglas, who does um, outside Xbox, uh, Keza McDonald uh, was also around at that time. There's only like a few of us together and we kind of hung out uh, and hung, clung to each other like sort of limpets in a storm or something. It was, it was a very weird thing to be in this industry where you felt very, very, you know, very, very much so in a, in a minority. Um, and I think uh, even going so far as back, like when I used to go to like review events and stuff, and being like one of the only women in the room, um, there is that kind of weirdly, I don't know, I'd feel acutely aware that like somehow I was representative of all womankind. I mean, I know that's not the case, but that's certainly like how I felt. Uh, and sometimes when I'd be like playing games, I'd get stuck on a bit and then I'd be really embarrassed to ask for help because I felt like it was just, oh, I'm like, I'm the terrible rubbish girl gamer or something. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that gets in your head. Um, but generally speaking, you know, the games industry uh, for, for the part where in, in terms of like who I met, uh, you know, journalist wise and sort of like my peers were amazing. It was a really, really lovely experience. I've had some ludicrously fun times in the before times when they used to do video game events. Great. Amazing. Um, obviously, things have changed rather significantly now. I mean, they were changing even before obviously COVID happened. There were less and less kind of, you know, big kind of grand scale uh, events and stuff like that. One of the things I did notice, though, uh, you know, being a female in the industry was just the sort of the comments that I would get compared to uh, comparable men in a sort of similar position or even sometimes not even the same position as me. Uh, their opinions were clearly revered, whereas I was always kind of questioned, which was a bit annoying. Um, I did make the mistake when I was doing the Bravo TV show to like Google myself. That was an error um, in hindsight. Uh, I don't think anything can really prepare you for reading like it's like you know when you're at school and you like came into the changing rooms or something and everyone stopped talking and then you realized that they were all talking about you and then you suddenly have that horrible sick feeling in your stomach kind of like that but like over and over again um like you know you sort of feel like you've just walked into a room and everyone's just talking about how terrible you are or something I don't know um so it was kind of a lot to deal with um and initially I used to get quite heavily into arguments with these let's just call them idiots uh online and again, it's it's a small percentage of men. It's not, it wasn't like a huge, like giant number, but very vocal, small minority. Um, and I used to get into some very, very long winded debates because I was like, I'm smarter than them. I can outsmart them. All of their arguments are complete, like bullshit, basically. But I'd spend all my time being really angry and like doing stuff and like furiously writing like really like salty Facebook replies, you know, when people use Facebook. Um, <laughs> and uh, I kind of kept getting into it and I was uh, dating someone at the time and like, my partner was just like you're so like stressed and angry all the time at all this stuff because I couldn't not reply you know and he was like you should just not get involved just just don't say anything like just leave it let these people think what they want and you know it's that classic thing of like don't feed the trolls and whilst I sort of <laughs> I don't think I really agree with that in principle I mean I think there are some people who are just like super hateful and it's 
just ignore that. But what happened at that time, we were all told to say nothing. And it never really sat right with me. Like my superpower as a human is just to shut up and be quiet. Shh, just don't say anything, it's fine. Which just sounds like this sort of like weirdly 1950s attitude towards women. I always thought, anyway, I didn't really like it, but then I did it because I was like, everyone, everybody told me to do that. And I just didn't like it. I was sitting there at home, like, you know, getting these comments and just not saying anything and not kind of getting involved. And I was like, there's got to be a different solution to this because all we're doing is we're saying that the online space is perfectly acceptable to say, oh, sorry, to say all of these things without being challenged. Screw that. Like, it's part of the reason why things became so bad later was because we just left this void of not addressing these problems. You know, you've let them just run riot and say whatever they like without challenging them. And like, that's not, that's not really how it works. So I was trying to think of a way to respond back, but kind of get people on side. Cause I felt like when I talked about it, the men I spoke to about it didn't really understand or like couldn't believe that I would get such comments. And a lot of the comments I would get are quite aggressively sexual, uh, violently sexual kind of comments. And, you know, whilst you could say, oh, well, they're never going to do anything about that. But bearing in mind as a woman uh, growing up, the likelihood of something terrible happening to you is probably at the hands of somebody you know very well. And we are all acutely aware and have probably all had experiences along those lines. So if somebody we know really well, potentially even a friend or a husband uh, can do horrible things to us, what is weird man on Internet capable of? I mean, surely he should be capable of so much more because he doesn't even know us and theoretically doesn't even care for us, you know? So these are the kind of things that sort of like play on your mind when you get these sort of very aggressive sexualized comments. Um, well, it's what played on my mind. And uh, I didn't really like it, but I really wanted to show people that this was what was going on because every time I mentioned it, no one believed me. They were like, oh, you're imagining it. Oh, it's just the same for guys. Or oh, I was like, I was really, I really don't think they say these similar things to men at all. Um, so basically, I thought the best way of dealing with it was humor. So I, I tried to get myself into a position where I could reply, where my heart wasn't racing. I'd never post anything if my heart was racing because it meant that I wasn't in the right hilarious frame of mind to come up with a good response. So I'd wait till I'd calm down and then I'd post something. So um, I'm trying to think of like some good examples because I sort of, when I did it, I used to screen grab. I'd take away their name as well because I sort of felt like at that time it was sheer ignorance rather than kind of malicious intent. They just didn't know any better. This is how you spoke to women and this was acceptable. So I used to take that because I didn't want to turn a guy into like a hateful lifelong campaign against me by kind of outing him publicly. Better to quietly humiliate him <laughs> than hopefully he'll learn from his mistake. Um, so uh, I'm just trying to think of like some good examples. Um, there was um, one guy said, what did he say? Uh, I want you to, uh, I want you to come and sit on my face. Uh, and I said, oh, um, I don't think I can, I don't think I can date a guy who can't afford chairs. And then there was another guy who like in all capitals said, uh, I want to F you from behind whilst grabbing your tea and then on your face, all in capitals, like quite aggressive. Uh, and then I said, oh, I don't think you could manage that level of multitasking. You can't even take off caps lock. So it was this kind of thing, right? So I'd, I'd take these screen grabs, write these stupid things and replies, take them out and then post them up. And um, which was good because then it's kind of like everyone can laugh at the, the ignorance whilst also educating everybody else that these are the sort of things that happen. Um, and still everyone's like, oh, I can't believe it. And you're like, this is, this. I, why do I... It's annoying that I have to prove evidence, but okay, fine, here it is, take a look. So I ended up doing this after, this had been going on for quite a long time and a friend suggested that I put it into a blog. I made into this blog called Misogyny Monday where I'd like post a different, up, different one up each week. Uh, off the back of that, I wrote an article for The Guardian about it. Someone saw it, it was quite convoluted. Anyway, I ended up doing a TED talk about it, um, like a TEDx talk, which was amazing, terrifying. That was fully, I did breathing techniques for that. That was terrifying. That was on stage in front of 1300 people. I didn't even realize that were many people there. I could, I only saw the front few rows and it wasn't until afterwards I realized that like all the chairs went like up like that and there was all full. And then, yeah, I'm glad I didn't see that before. I don't think I could have dealt with that. Cause it was, you know, standing on stage is difficult with the best of times. 
if I was just waffling on about video games and how much I loved them, easy. But this was like heavily to timed. I was talking about sexism, misogyny within the gaming industry. I knew full well if I didn't word it correctly, uh, my life online was over and probably squat teams would be sent to my house, you know, or other such horrific things. Um, it was also the night of the EU referendum. So that was fun. I was trying not to watch the TV whilst learning my lines. It was a, a lot of things to consider all at one go, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's just too much going on. It, it doesn't even really register all the other things, it's fine. Um, that was amazing. It's probably one of the best things I ever did. Um, and even as a presenter, that was like top tier terror. <laughs> It's like, there's no script, there's no auto cue. You have a few sides, you have a very, very big clock that counts down like this sort of like oppressive force telling you to hurry the hell up and get to the end. Um, but it, yeah, it was, it was one of the best things that I've um, ever done. Um, and I think sometimes like in life, like when, when they first offered it to me, I was absolutely terrified. Like as soon as the guy mentioned it on the phone, my hands started sweating. Like I actually felt straight away, my hands started sweating and my gut reaction was just like, I don't want to do this. This sounds horrible. This sounds like the worst idea in the entire world. And I looked at my sweaty palms and I thought, this should probably means I should do it. I don't know, because there's, it's like, okay. An example I think for like life is um, if you go to the gym and you do the same things all the time over and over and over again, right? Your body just gets used to doing the same things like over and over again. And you never really see what you're fully capable of. It's only when you push yourself past your comfort limit and then some, do you end up doing things uh, well, first of all, finding out what you're capable of. And second of all, doing things that you are so unbelievably proud of yourself for doing because you were so terrified. So anytime I get sweaty palms, um, when it's something to do with work, I tend to say yes, and then worry about all the rest of it later. So yeah, I did this whole thing. That was um, quite funny. One of the most amusing things, though, was um, the... The one I was telling you about, the guy with caps lock, who wanted to, you know, whatever me from behind. Uh, hilariously, um, they wouldn't let me put the full, like, swear words up. When I had it up on the screen, when I was doing the TED talk, they were like, you can't have swears in there. And I thought, this is quite amusing in regard that sort of, you know, women, girls can get these horrific messages all the time, horrible language all the time. But when we do it, you know, on a stage in a public environment, it's, that's, that's where people draw the line. You sort of think like it's quite ridiculous actually. But anyway, I mean, I sort of get why they did it. I fully understand, but it just, in, in the terms of like societal sort of perspective of it, it seems a bit mad when you think about it. So yeah, that was kind of a Saturday Monday. Um, it got to the point where I was really excited to get horrible comments, genuinely really excited. And then they just kind of stopped. <laughs> I, think I, I think I won the internet. No one sent me a prize yet, but I feel like I did. Um, and I think, you know, what was good was kind of showcasing and letting people know that this wasn't because like part of the point of my TED talk was that whilst it's really horrible that all these things happen, what is also really, really horrible as well, almost as horrible as the message itself is the fact that when you tell someone about your experience, if somebody instantly is like, well, that's not how it goes. It's one of the most horrifically undermining, hurtful things in the entire world, right? That disbelief is almost as bad as the horrific message itself. For someone not to believe you. You remember when you're a kid and you're trying to tell an adult that something's happened and they don't believe you and it's just that horrible feeling. And like, there's no feeling quite like it where someone just doesn't trust you or trust your opinion. Like you're delusional. Like you want to like imagine all these really horrible things. Why would I want to imagine horrible things in the world? There's lots of horrible things in the world already. I'd quite like my world to be lovely and not horrible. But the fact that it is as bad that I have to make a point about it means that it's bad. And having someone undermine you is just, yeah, awful. Anyway, but I do feel like we are in a slightly different kind of framed uh, kind of look at the world now where people are being believed rather than disbelieved um which is which is kind of how it was initially honestly even after i did the um even after i did the garden article and i had these screen grabs of all these comments people were still like yeah but you could have faked them they don't look look at how pixely they are it's like i didn't think i was gonna like have to use them as evidence later down the line for something even when you have evidence no one believes you honestly if you really want to make yourself sad look at the comments underneath my my tedx talk it's like yeah, I don't. Well, I I read them a couple of times, but also it's just like I was really, really careful about wording things correctly and not like I was like, 
obviously it's not all men as I said previously and I knew that this was going to be kind of like a sticking point for my talk so like one of the first things that I basically said was like I just want to make this abundantly clear that this is a very very small percentage of men who sent me these messages and I don't want you to think that this is some kind of hateful message about men in general because it's really not it's really not to the point where I had a slide that said not all men and then I just stood there and then I was like okay, let's move on. Let's have a conversation now. And even then they were like, ah, you're misandrist. You hate all men. I was like, did you watch the, you can't win sometimes. I think just as long as you can do your best and kind of highlight these things, I think it's um, really useful. I mean, part of the reason why I did it was because uh, I felt it was a disservice really to other women who were going to come later, who were just going to have to put up with the same crap that I had to go through. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave where I was as broken as I found it. So that was kind of thing. Anyway, so yeah. Um, but then there are other fun things that happened. Like uh, I wrote about um, why there weren't, I, I asked the question, I wrote a Vice article about why there weren't any professional Call of Duty, like female Call of Duty teams. And this was at a point when um, Esports was pr still pretty, like first few years of kind of infancy, like in, in the UK in any kind of serious way. Um, I wrote this article, uh, I got a whole load of hate for it. Uh, I had people who made the game who privately messaged me saying that they agreed with me, but publicly couldn't. Uh, and then I was working, doing some esports hosting for Call of Duty stuff. Um, and then I was never hired again, coincidentally. I mean, you can read into that like what, what you will, like maybe it just was a bizarre coincidence, but you are acutely aware that sometimes you feel like if you do say something, you're going to be penalized for it in some way. I think it's very different now. I think people are very aware that that would be, they would be read for that and taken to task for that now. Um, but yeah, this, this is why people never stood up for themselves or came forward about different things because there were these horrible penalties for your career if you did that. I mean, this, this particular company I work for, I'd worked for them for quite a number of years doing a lot of Call of Duty events and I never did, I never did another one, you know, but there you go. Things are different now though. I don't want you, I don't want to be like really morose. I think things are infinitely better. I think we are on much better footing. I think um, there are a lot more positive things out there and you can really start to see an effect change if it's something that's important to you. Um, so yeah, okay, that was that kind of thing. Um, shall I move on to like, I've been waffling on, wait, that's quite a long time, right? Um, shall I move on Chris to like, maybe just more about like myself and my career, brand identity, that kind of thing? Um, I've got a couple of questions. Oh yeah, sure. Right, if, we, if we can interject. So uh, mm. the first comes from Will actually, uh, yeah. and he's asking, uh, do you have any other advice, you know, when it comes to like breathing techniques and everything, especially from, you know, like an interview? Uh, ah. standpoint on you know like how to prepare because of course there are always going to be times where you think something is going spectacularly wrong uh, as ah, well okay. and, and, you, and yeah. you want to make sure that you are of course going oh do I need to change tack do I need to change my approach like do you have any advice that you could offer uh, okay. in that regard as well okay if you're pitching stuff don't learn things by rote right don't learn a script because no matter how well you learn that script you're going to totally sound like you've learned a script and you're never going to get across your personality and you're never going to get across your passion in the same way as if you freestyle generally speaking with all everything you're going to do in your life hopefully hopefully you're going to follow your passion and what you're into in which case then you're a total nerd nerd about your subject which is great nerds are the best obviously um and to go into um, uh, a meeting, say you were selling an idea or like pitching a show, or I mean, I don't know, whatever the thing is that you want to do when you want to sell to somebody. What I would suggest is breathing techniques, do run throughs of what you want to say, but keep it as short as possible. Don't try and cram in too much information. To, people can only absorb so much information. It's why... When you watch TV shows, like the pieces to camera at the start always tend to be quite short. It's like, well, hi, I'm blah, and I'm here with blah, and we're going to blah and blah and blah, right? It's always really short. You make anything too long and, and too, many, too many facts, too much information, people can't take it all in. It's too much, right? So just keep it really, really short, really, really sweet. If they want to know more, they will ask further questions, right? And being able to just focus on the very, very most important things uh, shows confidence in your idea that the idea is strong enough, right? I would say write a script, 
but I don't I don't mean to stick to it, but just write a rough script of like, okay, we're going to start talking about like where this idea came from and why I think it's important. What is the idea? What does it solve? You know, work out the rough structure like that. Then what I would do is I would bullet point keywords. So like, like word triggers for you to talk about, like, like why is it important? And then you just speak. Um, what's it going to change? Like what's gone before or what, whatever the thing is, almost have like trigger prompts, right? So all you have to remember is that sort of flow. When you talk about something in your, in your normal speaking voice uh, and it's something you're, that you love and that you're passionate about, there's something just about natural speak that just cannot be, you know, we're not actors, you know, we're not going to be able to get across a convincing performance of why we think this is important if I'm trying to think what the next word in that sentence is. It just doesn't work. You talk all the time. You know, you make sentences out of nothing. You don't think about it. You're just, you know, designed to do that, right? So if you can basically keep like, and also here's a bit of a cheat, like if you're really, really worried and you think you might forget stuff, this is my sneaky, sneaky, also top tip, right? If you're really worried that you're going to forget your order of something, get a very, very small piece of paper, right? Like this, like this big, right? Hold it in your hand like that. Write your six like keyword prompts for whatever the discussion is that you're about to have. Stick it in the palm of your hand like this, right? Keep it really, really small in the palm of your hand. So you can still kind of like talk, blah, 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 blah. But then you can always just do a little sneaky look down to your hand for the next prompt. So like if you're if you're really nervous and you think that your nerves are gonna mean that once you stand up there, you're gonna forget what you're talking about, right? Just keep it in your hand. You can basically hold your hand down and just like look to the floor. So it looks like you're looking at the floor and you can see, oh, okay, design, right? The design of this thing is really, really important and why it's different to the, you know, whatever the keyword is that's gonna prompt you. And then you can just keep it flow, keep it smooth, keep it passionate. You can look at them and engage with them because you're talking as you normally would. And trust me, I've used this many times. Didn't for a TED talk, because I was too worried I wasn't gonna see my hand, but um, I once did stand up comedy and I wrote keywords on my thumb because I knew I was gonna hold a mic there. So I was like that, 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 and that, and no one could see it because I was really nervous. So there's lots of really sneaky ways you can look really confident, even if you're not. And like, it's nice to have a little crutch sometimes if you're not used to like speaking in public, like if, if you're someone whose nerves get really the better of them sometimes. Breathing techniques, write a script, work it down and then basically squidge it into like your keyword prompts. So you know roughly what you're gonna talk about and then you can just work out the sentences around it as you go. And then if you still feel really, really nervous, I'd run it through like a bunch of times the night before, do it in front of some friends, like over Zoom or whatever, get a bit of feedback, like that's really useful. The more you do it and the more comfortable you can stand up in front of people, the better you're gonna sell your idea because you're gonna exude confidence and confidence in you is confidence in your idea. So, sorry, that was a bit waffly. No, uh, really, really useful. In fact, um, there was another question that came through from Sunny. Um, yeah. And Sunny was focusing on if you're delivering um, a talk or, you know, you're standing up, you're presenting, you're doing anything like that. There's yeah. always going to be that time, you know, where your heart races and, you know, you don't yeah. have that opportunity, you know, to undertake those breathing exercises mm. um, because you can't just stop in the middle of like a live demonstration or anything. What would okay. you say your best advice is, you know, to help with that? And how would you, you know, encourage students to, to think okay. about that when they move forwards? always try and do it before like the breathing stuff before you do it just to kind of but if you're someone who suddenly has like a mid panic <gasps> whatever okay there's a couple of things you can do first of all remember you don't have to answer a question straight away if somebody asks you a question about something in particular you are fully entitled to take a breath this is the time that you take a breath you slow your breathing just by one breath maybe two breaths look like you're thinking of something Okay, you know, you are allowed to use that time to think and use that time just to get a couple of nice, slow, deep breaths in there and just do it kind of as subtly as you can. If you are someone who has just like a constant level of anxiety, there's another really, really good top tip that I taught myself, which is, um, any of you guys watch RuPaul's Drag Race? Um, have you ever noticed how RuPaul's hand, when, when she stands on stage, when he stands on stage, is uh, he's always doing something like really weird with his hand like this? I guarantee that's from nerves. I bet he's basically putting his nail 
into his hand, right? Here's the thing, when you're nervous, it kind of like comes across in your body. And I've done shows where like I'd be sitting in a chair or something like that. And what I would do is I would get my toe on the floor. Imagine this is my, my big toe. So I'm sitting cross-legged. I wanna look really comfortable and relaxed, even if I'm absolutely not. I would put my big toe onto the floor, right? And just, or inside my shoe and push down just on my toe, just push on it, right? So it's almost like slightly painful, but not really. And basically what you're doing is you're putting all of your anxiety into one little bit of your body so that the rest of your body can just be really relaxed and chill. And it's like putting all that tension into a foot or a hand, or you can like put your nail into your, um, into here or like maybe you know you can do something I choose the foot because I figure people can sometimes see my hands or whatever but you can kind of channel all that anxiety into there so that's a really really good one definitely works uh, and yeah the sneaky thinking breath is also really really useful as well okay thank you um if we if we want to carry on I've got a couple of other questions but I think they're more suited as we move forwards uh, if that's all right so if we jump into the, the next little bit all right. Okay. How do you present yourself and maintain a brand identity? I don't know. What even is that these days? It's mad. I think like when I first started presenting, I'd talk to mates about like, you know, I had an agent and they're like, you have to do things like this and do things like that. And, you know, you don't like say these things and you behave in this kind of way. And, and it's really funny. And, you know, you have to kind of maintain this social presence online. And now like, I feel really sorry for everyone. Like I chose this as a job sadly and it's part of my job and I still kind of hate that it's part of my job but it's part of my job so I kind of accept it and it's kind of I kind of feel sorry that everyone has to have some sort of brand identity almost even if they don't do anything to do with this like nonsense do you know what I mean it's quite annoying I can imagine I mean I don't know you might love it um I think the easiest thing like I've always I was very much a tomboy growing up right I don't know if that's really a useful phrase. At the time, that's what everyone called it, tomboy. It doesn't even mean anything anymore. But like, I never really wore makeup. I got loads of brothers. Most of my friends were male. Um, I, when I first got into presenting, I literally turned up at this to meet this guy who was involved in making this channel in like some like pajama bottom trousers and like a jumper that I'd bitten like the wrist off of. I was a really emo-y, grungy child, teenager. Um, and like, I look terrible, I never wore makeup. I remember sitting in this kind of, uh, this first kind of chat we were having to, about going to this audition next week. And he was literally just like, yeah, you, you just saw that out, you know, before you go to that kind of thing. And I was like, oh God. And it was at the time where I'd like never really dressed quote unquote femininely, whatever that meant. Uh, and I kind of thought that to dress like a woman was like one thing, like this is how women dress. Like they're this like singular thing. Like, I didn't get it at all. I was like terrified. I remember they like took me out shopping and made me buy all the stuff that I just hated, 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 hated it. But I thought that's what I was supposed to do, you know, to like do TV presenting, you got to like look a certain way and all this sort of stuff. And it wasn't until, you know, sort of figuring out kind of who I was, what a more feminine version of Julia was, because I didn't really know what that was. I'd literally never played with that at all growing up at all. Um, and figuring out kind of like who I was. Uh, did I finally sort of find kind of peace with everything? And like now I'm, you know, I like putting on makeup and wearing a nice dress and doing things and stuff like that. Um, I never thought I would. I really, really didn't. I thought I was just gonna be one of these like fresh bare faced people the whole of my life. Um, but yeah, I think like with presenting, certainly it's about figuring out who you are. And as soon as you know who you are, it's all very easy. All the decisions become very, very easy. And I think now we're in, we're in a, a better place where you can be quite honest about who you are and what you are into and what you like and what you don't like without kind of fear of reprisals quite in sort of like the same way you're supposed to be this like weird, you don't have to be this kind of weird airbrushed version of yourself. Well, I mean, unless you're into that. Um, so I think, yeah, having that sort of brand identity and the brand identity should always kind of be you really, whatever it is that you're kind of into. And I suppose maybe it's, it's very specific if I'm talking about being a presenter, but like say you were like a, like a game dev or whatever, and you're thinking about like the brand that you have to put forward. 
as long as you're passionate about your subject, and I'm pretty sure if you're going into it as a career, then you will be, then it's really easy what you post up and how you maintain that identity because you just talk about things that you're interested in. That's it. That's literally it. Um, I think like, and, and how to present yourself. I, don't, I think just really be honest, you know, I think sometimes we can really, really overthink things. I'm, if anything, I'm an oversharer <laughs> with how I'm thinking and how I'm feeling, but um, I don't know, maybe that's just because I'm a presenter. I just like talking about everything, even if no one else wants to talk about it. Like, yeah. Um, uh, Julia, um, yes. just, uh, just with that, um, mm. there's a, there is a question that I, that I said I was going to hold fire on a little mm. bit more. Um, uh, it comes from Solomon, and he's he's asking how how would you stop um, like doubting yourself? Then you know, if you're wanting to present something, and you and you get it into your mind that you know you're not necessarily the best person to do that job, or you or you feel that you know some there's somebody else that might be on the cards, you know, as a potential alternative presenter or anything like that. How mm. how would you deal with that? What sort of advice would you offer? Okay, so I feel like imposter syndrome because of the way that social media is nowadays and it's just so like its tentacles just get into everything. I think imposter syndrome is everywhere. And even I go through it where I'm just like, oh, I don't know why do I... it, it happens, right? It happens to everybody. And I think you just have to remember that it's just, that's all it is, right? Like the reason why you are standing in front of that person, the reason why you are there, there is a reason for it is because you want it. There's something about, doing this that has attracted you, which means you are deserving of it. Obviously, everybody's brain is evil and it will naturally just tell you a whole bunch of negative crap because it just wants to, your brain wants you just to coast through life doing the same thing over and over because it's easier. It don't want to learn new things. It don't want, like, that's why it makes it hard, right? You need to not listen to your brain and just be like, right, this is what I want to do. Uh, this is what I want to learn and this is what I want to go into. You have to understand that. Uh, your brain can tell you some really, really negative stuff. Like I'm, I've suffered with depression my whole adult life. This is something I'm acutely aware of. Um, it's just how negative my head can be if I let it. I just tell it to shut up. Like if I'm going through like a really negative spiral where I'm just like, I'm worthless, I shouldn't be doing this job, I'm like not qualified or whatever the thing is that's kind of going on in like your head. You just need to tell it to shut up. And I know I appreciate that sounds a lot easier than it is. You need to break that cycle of that comment, right? either by telling yourself every time it says something negative, you have to say something positive and you need to make that a habit. Don't let it get away. You've got to keep that tally even. Every time it says something negative, you've got to say something positive. It's really difficult to do and really annoying, but it's really useful. If it, you're getting super spirally and you're, you're getting really upset or really frustrated or really anxious and you can't even muster that up, break the cycle by going somewhere and doing something else. Because like if I was sitting at my desk and having like, super negative thoughts like over and over and over again and I was like I can't even say anything nice to myself I would get up I would go somewhere else I'll go for a walk I would change my scenery I'd look at something else break that cycle of that negative thing I remember once seeing this counselor and I was telling them about how I just burst into tears in a boots one day and I'd like never really thought about it before she was like why did you start crying in a boots and I was like I don't know I was just walking around like looking at things and I burst into tears and she was like well what were you thinking about beforehand and I was like, oh, I don't know. And then I sort of thought about it and I was like, oh, I'd seen this thing and it reminded me of this other thing. And then it made me think about work. And then did, and then and then I said all these like negative, like 20 negative things to myself. And she's like, well, no wonder you just burst into tears. You were just really horrible to yourself. Obviously, you burst into tears <laughs> like that just makes sense. Um, so I think once you start recognizing. Like those little things in your head, those little moments and being able to kind of try and calm and control them as best you can because the thing is it's really difficult to start with as is everything it's really difficult to start with to make yourself more confident and all these things like so hard to start with but it's so worth it and every time you do it subsequently it's a little bit easier and a little bit easier until you almost like unprogram your head of like negative stuff it will still always come back it will always be there but you are you are ready and with the tools to combat it when it does um, it just takes a little bit of perseverance, but it's so worth it. And then once you kind of overcome those things, so say you, you know, you've gone now into this, uh, this, you know, you're going to present this thing, you're going to pitch this thing, and then you've done it, and it was really difficult. But you, you know, you, you calmed yourself down, you prepped the, as best you could, and then you come out the other side, right? Okay. Once you've done something once, you can then use that to shut yourself up. 
you'd be like, yeah, but I've done this before. So obviously it's gonna be fine. So you can use it as ammunition to do the next thing. And then you're like, well, I've done this three times before and actually it was fine in the end. So be quiet brain. You don't know what you're talking about. So you can keep using that. There's another thing as well about framing, how you look at how well you've done at something. Perfectionism is an absolute killer. It's basically like a chain around your neck that will just make you miserable and drag you down all the time. I used to become fully obsessed with trying to be perfect at my job. Nonsense, who cares, it's rubbish. There's no such thing as perfection. All you ever have to do, and this is the only, this is the only framework I judge what I've done and how I do in my life, is to do your best, right? So your best can be fully different depending on which time of day, what happened the night before, did you sleep? Did you have all the information you needed beforehand? Did something weird happen before you went in the interview? Did like one of your friends say something really dickish before like you did this and it really twisted you out or like whatever the thing is, right? You can only ever do your best, right? Go into a situation and be like, right, let's just, I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna try and get the best result that I can under these circumstances, right? You go in, you do the pitch, maybe in the greatest scheme of pitches and, and the, the, the scale of how good you can do your pitches, you were at 50%. So it could have been better, right? But at that moment in time, you did it to the best of your ability at that time. And if you can say that to yourself and walk away from that whole experience and basically say, I did my best. That's all that matters. You might do a pitch that's worse than that one day, but it's still your best because something really crap happened just before you went in or like, I don't know, you were pitching something and your laptop died or I don't know, whatever the thing is, right? Under the circumstances, as long as you can walk away saying you've done your best, that is, that is the only bar you should ever measure your life with because then you will always be happy with what you've done as long as you've given it the best shot that you can under those circumstances. And don't worry about like, it was better or worse than anyone else's because nobody else was doing it with those particular circumstances. I thought about this once. Um, I did a bungee jump, right, when I was 17. I was on holiday with some friends. That, uh, it's going somewhere, trust me. Um, and I remember I was, I'm terrified of heights. Absolutely spectacularly terrified of heights. But I was like, I'm doing it. I'm gonna do this bungee jump, right? I went up. I nearly passed out. I thought I was like having a heart attack. It was horrific, right? But I thought it was quite a good thing to do because I was like, maybe I'll get over my fear of heights. I mean, it didn't work, but I, I persevered. Um, and all I remember was I was standing at the top of this thing and I was thinking, well, I'm not coming back down. And like all of my friends were standing at the bottom watching me and I jumped off and it was rubbish. Like, you know, you're supposed to kind of like dive forward. I basically did like this jump that was like, <laughs> and then went down the wrong way and then blah, 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 and it just looked stupid, whatever. And I got off this thing and one of these guys I'd like gone on holiday with was like, <laughs> that was like a terrible jump. Like what even were you doing? And I thought to myself, fuck off. Like number one, you didn't do it. You didn't do what I just did. You're standing there telling me how I should have done it. And you were too chicken to even try it. So first of all, shut up. Second of all, no one knew just the internal turmoil that I was dealing with that meant that I did even a jump. I was so happy I'd done a jump because I knew everything that I'd been through all the way up there. And it was this really like traumatic thing, blah, 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 but I'd done it. And for me, that was absolutely the best that I could have done under those circumstances. I felt great. This other guy was an idiot. Nonsense. But like, honestly, it's, it's such a really good way to kind of frame how you look at life. No one else's opinion really matters only your own. I mean, like, of course, ask for advice from your peers and things like that. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, if you've done the best that you can do, that's all that matters. Is there someone <laughs> um, then, Julia, that you would say that you look up to, you know, and someone that you get advice from more than more than any? I know you mentioned, you know, spending time with Keza and Jane. Would would you always reach out to those, you know, to gain, you know, reassurance on your work? Uh, if that's not too much of a personal question. Oh, no, not so. So um, like like Jane's, you know, one of our best friends uh, in the whole world. She's amazing. Um, and uh, certainly, yeah, you know, we will talk quite honestly and openly about kind of things that are things that are sort of going on. Jane's Jane's career is like ever so slightly different. So obviously we both kind of do on camera stuff, but hers is kind of more focused sort of like on, you, on, on YouTube and, and sort of things like that. Um, I think I think like some of the, the issues that have kind of cropped up um, doing like broadcast stuff uh, or like radio stuff sometimes can be quite specific. I would still talk to her about them, of course, as well. But I have like a really amazing agent 
Uh, and I've been through having lots of different agencies. Like I've been with some really big agencies, but I never felt like I got that same, that like the, the agent that I'm with right now is someone who I can really talk to and be like super honest and open about like, oh God, I'm, I'm completely terrified about this thing or like, what about this thing? And, and he can give me his kind of advice and feedback. So there is that. I just felt like in terms of people who've done, had like a, like a similar sort of career to me in the UK, there's actually not really been a lot of people who've kind of, the way I've kind of positioned myself in terms of my career was I could have maybe, you know, gone to like a IGN or like a GameSpot and kind of done video game presenting sort of from within that. But my idea was always to, I wanted to change people's perspective of uh, what video games are and that they're not for just like, you know, loser nerds in their bedrooms covered in crisps or whatever nonsense people think of it. And so I kind of like position myself sort of like half in gaming, but kind of half out in sort of more kind of mainstream, which ultimately meant that my career was really difficult because no one else had really done that before. So it was a bit of a wobbly, wiggly path uh, and loads of moments of like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why have I made it so hard for myself? You know, those kind of moments. Um, but ultimately it's what it's what I wanted to do. So it's, um, yeah, it's um, it's been an odd little journey, but um, but a fun one though. But then, you know, greater risk, greater reward, all that sort of stuff. So we'll see. Absolutely. And um, just going to, unfortunately, I don't have a name attached to this question. Mm. It's just come through as an anonymous. Um, yeah. But do you feel that with more women being involved within the games industry now, and rightly so, do you feel that that's had like a positive uh, spin? Do you feel that you've probably influenced people in your own right, you know, with like Misogyny Monday and, you know, telling people that, you know, there are going to unfortunately be uh, individuals, you know, that want to, you know, uh, hate call for, for no uncertain term, but you feel that you've had a positive impact on those, um, you know, for, for joining as well, and that with more uh, women within the industry as well, having a wider scope of representation? I hope I have. I mean, it's a hard thing to sort of quantify, but I, I hope I did. I mean, that was the sort of point I wanted to say to people that this kind of thing goes on, but, you know, ultimately, if once everyone can kind of start seeing and sort of supporting each other in that. And I think fully that's where we're at now. Um, it's not so terrifying. Whereas before, I, I feel like we all, as women in the industry, were slightly terrified to call people out. Like putting your head above that parapet felt terrifying. And I didn't want to be scared anymore. I was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> like, forget it. I'm not gonna be intimidated by these schools. Um, so yeah, um, and I think definitely that has, change now I think everyone's very very supportive of uh, everyone else because also there was that thing as well you know where women are always kind of slightly pitted against each other so like if somebody gets that job then you don't get that job because there was only one job or something you know and there was this sort of like horrible thing where you felt like you were I was constantly competing against like some of my closest friends and stuff like that and you know like you sort of feel like because there were less opportunities. But actually what happens is, is like the more women come into the industry and the more women get that get jobs, the more jobs there are because you've grown the industry in a different way. So it's, yeah, it was kind of like a weird thing initially, but it didn't really last all that long. And anyway, like when you're friends with people and sort of go drinking with them, it's really hard to be hate, think hatefully about them if they get a job that you don't because you ultimately like them as a friend, you know? Okay, um, one from uh, Bethany. Um, do you Hi, believe Bethany. that the uh, games industry is becoming more or less uh, um, welcoming to marginalised identities? Um, and if you could think of anything that would change the industry, what would you like to change about it? Ooh, um, I definitely think uh, that everyone is like fully aware of uh, being able to kind of represent better within uh, within the industry. I think that's that's been forever changed and that won't ever go back. And I think lots of uh, companies are creating really, really positive steps internally, externally to try and move things in the direction that they should. So I think that that's, that's, that's set in stone and is kind of on its way to progressing. What would I like to change about the industry um, if I could? Mm, um, I think probably like the nicest thing would be, I remember like when I was first kind of starting out and I used to do game reviews 
uh, for magazines and stuff like that, but like kind of more mainstream magazines. So some of your reviews would be like 50 words long or like a hundred words long because it was, you know, a more kind of mainstream magazine. And I think it'd be really nice if people who reviewed games got like paid for the amount of hours that they actually work playing a game. Cause it's not like reviewing a film where you just sit down for two minutes and you're like, and then you type something out. Like, you know, say if you review God of War or something, you know, like, you're going to be there for quite a significant amount of time before, you know, you're writing up those reviews. But I, I think they are much better actually about like pay and like pay parity and things like that. I think that has changed. I mean, I don't really know in telly because I don't really review stuff so much anymore from, from what I can ascertain uh, from kind of looking out in uh, it has. Um, what else would I change about the industry? Ah, you know, what I would really, really love is I would love there to be more, um, like programming on like main terrestrial channels. I know it, I know we don't really need it because we don't because we're games and we make our own content that we want. But I think to really fully change people's perspectives about games, even though like now lockdown, people are a lot more aware of the positives of games. It is still that whole thing where it's like, oh, you know, that's in the bedroom. Um, I would like there to be like more kind of mainstream like terrestrial channels that would make gaming programs. I mean. The amount of nonsense they make about everything else we're like the we're like the biggest entertainment platform in the entire world and are growing year on year we like we tower above the rest of every other industry and yet they'll have bunches of like music shows and film shows and different stuff like that but there needs to and i don't mean just like one big show there needs to be like 10 shows about video games minimum you know just in the impact and everything that they're doing it's um it's still ultimately really frustrating in the uk um it feels like a real grind, you know, to sort of like get things commissioned and people don't really understand it. America is amazing when it comes to stuff like that. Like they really do get gaming and kind of respect it and commission more stuff. So I hope that in the future, the UK can kind of, yeah, move things forward a little bit in that regard. That'd be lovely. I do feel that as well, that there's still the stigma associated with it being, you know, like a male dominated industry. I know uh, oh, yeah. from like the esports perspective being mm. heavily, you know, male orientated. Uh, would you like to see a rise in, in female competitors as well? Do you, would you like to have like female only, only leagues as well? Obviously, I know we think about that from like a, a footballing perspective. You have you yeah, know, your male league, your female league, or, or would you just like to have everything? So it's it's a tricky thing. Like when you look at something like, okay, you look in like normal white sports. So you look at like the W series, right? I mean, first of all, like before we even get into it, please, why did you call it the W series? It's like calling it like the vagina monologues or something. Just call it something else that isn't like directly linked to like the women's series anyway. But like, I can sort of appreciate it's kind of, whilst I don't really want to agree with sort of segregation, right? Into have like male and female, especially when it comes to esports, because there's no physical difference that we shouldn't really have to do that. But like, there's got to be a reason why more women aren't kind of coming through and like, what can we do? And I was having this conversation actually um, uh, with some people at esports, probably better not to like specifically name names, but um, I was talking about, maybe there was a way instead of having like a separate like having like a separate league for women, if there was a way of doing like male, like, or like kind of like uh, multi-gendered um, like teams. So it was like, instead of it being like, we're, like women are over here, uh, you just have a rule in a particular tournament that says that it can't just be all one gender uh, on a team. It's gotta be multi-gendered or something or however you wanna kind of like phrase it. So then ultimately, uh, you know, the, 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 the male competitors, it's then it's about lifting people up and helping them get better so that they can, you know, be more involved in that um, esport. But yeah, that's the only thing I've been kind of thinking. I've been trying to pitch that to like a couple of places, but um, I don't know how far I'm getting. I just think it, it, it's, I just feel like it's more positive than um, segregation and having like a separate league entirely. But I fully understand why it's necessary. Like you need to, you need to practice, you need to compete, but then really to be the best at anything, you have to compete with the best. So then Ultimately, that's, there's always going to be a bit more of a ceiling, right? And a bit more of a breakthrough from that. But then, yeah, it's all a little bit problematic in one way or another. Um, do you feel as well then, just from like that esports perspective, I know there's always a lot of talk, especially around Call of Duty, you know, like the uh, profanity that's used or the trash talking and, you know, popping off for, for no uncertain term at the end of each segment. Do you feel that that becomes a barrier as well? You know, that um, women or multi-gender, you know, don't want to get involved because of 
because of that, you know, stigma surrounding it as well. Yeah, and I think, I mean, like when I wrote this thing for Vice like a million years ago about Call of Duty, it was kind of like, uh, like posing the question of like, you know, whilst, you know, women play it, but not so much like within uh, a professional capacity, but what is it about the culture that means that if they do start, why don't they stick with it? And there has to be kind of questions around that. Like why, if there's not general uptake anyway, like why is that happening? Um, but if there is, why don't people, if they do, why do they drop out? Like what, what is it about those kind of cultures that maybe feel kind of intimidating? And whilst people can say like, oh, it's not intimidating. Like you have no idea. I was literally telling you a story earlier about like, even when I was reviewing games and I walked into a room full of like, you know, male games journalists, I felt like this weird pressure to sort of represent women. And then ultimately, even if it's affecting your performance by a few percent, that's enough to mean that perhaps you're not you know, you're not competing at your best if that's how it feels, you know? So I definitely think there is that, I mean, there is that kind of stigma and that is that kind of thing of like, it's it's gonna be a harsh environment. Like you've got to have like tough skin and it's, oh, it just all sounds a bit, so if you've got to do that and then you've got to do all your your training to like be the best, but then also you've got to have like, like rhino skin to like deal with it all. It's just, it sounds exhausting, frankly. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not surprised it's off putting even if you're into a particular game. Okay, um, I know we spoke about this separately, but do, would you like to share your story about the KSI, um, Logan Paul, uh, with, with the <laughs> oh. students as well? <laughs> okay, so if there is anyone out there who's watching who's ever wanted to do presenting or whatever, and actually I suppose this kind of can apply to a lot of different things, when I first got into presenting, I had this like really sort of like romanticized idea of what it'd be like, like someone sends you like a script and you're in your trailer just idly thumbing through it whilst you drink some sort of herbal tea and then someone calls you to set and you know, it's nonsense, right? It doesn't happen that way. Um, I spent an awful lot of like my early presenting life being really frustrated and annoyed because people would throw things at me last minute, like, like, okay, uh, here, we're gonna shoot all these pilots. Yes, there'll be an auto cue. So you half learn the script because there's an auto cue. Turn up, no auto cue. Or hello, I've turned up on this day. Um, I've learned this script. They're like, no, that's not the right script. We've changed it. Here's a different one. Here's some pages. Can you learn it? And you're like, oh my god, like completely. First of all, like totally unprofessional as far as I was concerned. But also, like to learn the script's really difficult. Like you need a bit of time to be able to do it, to be able to do your job well. This is what I was talking about doing your best within the circumstances. So that pilot that I shot that day wasn't great but the fact that they just told me I had to learn a script on the spot I thought I did all right you know all things considered um so understanding that things will always get thrown at you last minute and I don't think this is necessarily specific just to presenting things are always going to mess up last minute and it's being able to not get angry and assume that probably something will go wrong and you should just be aware that that might happen a good example of this was um I was um I was hosting the KSI Logan Paul fight, the first one in the UK in the Manchester arena. And um, I was quite aware that it was probably the biggest live audience live show that I've ever done. Um, really like broad mix um, in terms of kind of like eyeballs and, and who was there. And the plan originally was to have like these two, like this one like uh, Sky commentator and this other boxer with me, because at the end of the day, it's gonna be like, I don't understand boxing. I know like the, the I know the guys like really well, I do charity football matches and stuff for them. And that's why they sort of brought me in. Um, but I don't know boxing. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not gonna pretend to know what I'm talking about. I'm just there to kind of facilitate getting that information out of these two experts, because there's gonna be a lot of people who are watching this fight who have never seen boxing before. So we need to understand, you know, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> like we turn up to this like live stream. It's like, you know, you're like, I'm literally right by the ring, like, you know, live stream, like no pressure. They're going through the running order and they're like, right. So basically we'll go live to you. And then eight minutes in, we like go to um, the casters and then they're going to start off the fight and like, don't know. So then <laughs> I think it was maybe like earlier on in the morning, they said this Sky News pundit wasn't going to be there. So I was like, okay, right. Well, all right. You know, I've got like this professional boxer. This is fine. Um, about three minutes before live, come over there like oh hi Julie I'm like yeah they're like so um yeah we can't find him don't know where he is and I was like right so it's just three three minutes to live you were saying and um what was the time in the running order until I go to the cast to start the match and they were like eight minutes I'm like right okay now I could probably 
bullshit my way through three minutes of waffly chit chat when I know nothing about a subject, but eight, no, I'm no, that's not going to happen. Um, so I literally said to the guy, I was like, okay, find anybody, somebody who's done boxing once. I don't <laughs> just find someone I can ask some boss boxing questions to because eight minutes, just, it's not going to work. And then luckily they found this guy, I think they was Spencer or something. He like used to run like some boxing clubs or something like that. So they kind of brought him in. So I was like, okay, this is fine. Bit of a panic. And this was just before going live as well. So then I'm standing there in the arena, like the lights are on. Someone's counting me down in my ear, which is always like the, this is where you do the breathing thing. This is literally the moment you do the breathing. Um, and they're counting down. And I'm like, I was all a bit of a, like a fluster because of all this stuff that had happened. And I'm like, trying not to freak out that it's like one of the biggest live streams. And like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I, I can't talk about boxing, but we'll figure something out, you know? Um, so they're, they're counting me down. And I'm starting to freak out. Like there's stuff in my head, like, oh my God, this is gonna be such a trash fire. What are you doing? Like rah, 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 all this stuff. I was like, okay, no, I can't have this. I can't have this kind of level of chat going in my head because I'm gonna screw everything up, right? So I'm doing the breathing in for four, hold for one, out for eight, hold for one. You can do like a four, four box breathe, but that's my preferable way of doing it. So I was doing this, but like my head was still racing. It was just like, what are you doing? Like, blah, blah, blah. And what you need to do basically is to replace what is being said in your head. If your head is saying, oh, you're terrible, like what are you, blah, 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 whatever negative crap that's going on, you replace it with something else. I literally, I think, what did I say to myself for that one? For that one, I think I just repeated in my head. I was like, this is your job. You love your job. You know how to do this. You got this. And I just kept saying that over and over again in my head, like forcing myself to say it in my head because it doesn't come naturally. But by forcing yourself to say it over and over in your head, you take away the space for whatever the negative comment was. It can't fit in because you're basically saying this positive one over and over again. Um, so I kept doing that, kept saying that to myself. And I was worried because usually what happens when you get a bit flustery and a bit adrenaline-y, you mess up your opening piece to camera because you're a bit like, you know. And I was just like, like, you know this, you do this, this is your job, you love your job, it's going to be great. Like, like stuff like that. And then I did this opening piece to camera and it was basically perfect. And like, like I'm not talking about perfection normally, but it's perfect for me. I don't think I could have done it better under those circumstances and kind of chatted to this guy and it was all great and it all went totally fine. Um, but yeah, if you'd seen the chaos that was happening like a few minutes before, but there is all, you know, and like terrifying, right? If I was going to mess that up, I was going to stand there, but you just, you take a deep breath. There is always a solution somehow, some way there is a way of like making it work. Okay. It's not the ideal. We wanted these other guys, but you can do your best in those circumstances. And then you can walk away from that job or that pitch or whatever the thing is that you've just done being like, I smashed that. Because that's all that smashing it is, is you doing your best. I feel like I need some sort of little confetti cannon. It feels like a missed opportunity not having confetti. I'm just telling you that now. Uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do. We'll see what we can do. We'll, we'll green screen it in and, and those sort of things. It, it'll be fine. I've it'll got be some fine. Um, so from like a, a presenting point of view, what would mm. be the first bit of advice that you'd give to a student then that if they wanted to follow in your footsteps? like? Would it be, you know, practice those pitches, make sure that, you know, that is the first thing that they want to look at? Or would you say, you know, focus on the journalism side? What, what would you what would like, you like to do them? presenting as a job job? Yeah. OK, um, I think first of all, ask yourself the question of like, what kind of presenter do you want to be? You could literally do any kind of presenting about anything in any way, shape or form in a million different mediums. So have a think about what kind of stuff interests you. And that's usually the stuff that you just subconsciously like gravitate towards or whatever. Um, one of the biggest things about presenting is just getting used to doing stuff on camera and getting comfy. That's probably like your first hurdle that you'll have to kind of overcome. Uh, generally speaking, especially now, you're probably not gonna have like live auditions or anything like that. So getting used to camera is uh, really, really useful. So um, what I would say is when I look at a camera, so as I'm looking at this camera now, I don't focus my eyes on the camera. What I'm actually doing right now is I'm just looking almost like through it and like I've relaxed my eyes. So I have no idea like what it says on like the logo here or anything like that. I'm just looking through it. And it's like a sort of relaxed way of like almost like looking past it. Because if I focus on it, I'm then like really aware that like I'm looking at a camera and um, that's kind of like distracting in a way. So I just almost like relax my eyes and look past it. 
don't think about the fact that people are watching you, which is of course easier said than done, but just kind of relax into it. And like the only way really to stop thinking about that is just to practice on camera until it's like slightly boring. Basically, you just keep doing it until it's boring. So say you wanted to uh, do like TV presenting or like host a show or something, right? So the first thing I would tell you is uh, you need to get good at doing pieces to camera, like opening pieces to camera. So I would just write some, any old nonsense, like, hello, this is Julia, I'm here in Suffolk and we're gonna be talking about, you know, the bird fancier's ball or whatever stupid name of something to come up with. Um, and again, like write like three bullet points. So like uh, Norfolk, bird fancier's ball, and then one fact, right? Something like that. Three things, three bullet points, have them on a sheet next to your, next to your camera. Record it and then just freestyle. Just see, um, do these kind of opening pieces to camera and just like fill in the words, however you want to say it. Um, throw in some stupid stuff. So like if I ever do like a training thing, I make some of the names really ridiculous because if you can sell something that sounds freaking stupid, then you can sell something that sounds really normal do you know what I mean being being kind of comfortable on camera like you don't feel silly it's just you just do it kind of over and over again and like if I was um and like watch it back that's the most important thing as well because you'll notice things that you do I used to do the thing where I'd like stick my mouth out like this all the time I didn't really know why I was doing it until I watched it back I was like what is wrong with your mouth that's really weird stop doing that um so it's good to always kind of watch things back and just see how it comes across and like getting your positioning right your head you know just little things like that to show yourself in in the best possible in the best possible kind of like light and then if I was gonna like do like maybe like a whole show that was like semi-scripted or something like that I would um I would have like a rough script and then I'll just freestyle around it and like do it in front of the mirror look yourself in the eye it's quite difficult or like in front of like a window where you can kind of see yourself and just kind of see how your body moves when you kind of talk and, and different things like that. Just basically practice. If it's going to be your job and your career, don't just assume you're going to be able to like stand up and talk and it'll look great and you'll be really succinct and to the point. And there are so many different styles of presenting now. So, you know, if you were doing like, like open-ended live streaming, I can do like a really waffling, like, you know, opening piece to camera. But if it was like TV or radio or like a like a to time live show, you can't just be waffling on for like 20 minutes and introducing something. You need like three sentences or four sentences and you need to get to the point. So that in itself is another technique to learn. And it will all depend. I mean, personally, I think it's good for everybody, whether you present or not, to practice these things, because inevitably there'll be some point in your life where someone's going to make you stand up in front of people and say stuff or like make a corporate video or make a video or do you know you want to kickstart your your indie game and they're going to make you sit down and talk about it in front of a camera you want to be the best version that you can be at those moments so why not just get the practice in now when it doesn't matter if you get the practice in now when it doesn't matter when those moments come up and let's be honest it happens to everybody at some point in their life um you're halfway there you can just co concentrate on like what you're saying and the best way to come across meaning that um you're going to do an ultimately better job really so yeah just just honestly just practice don't assume that you can just rock up and just talk 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 have a look at what you're doing I mean it depends if you just wanted to like do streaming and stuff like that you can just be yourself fully and you don't have to think about any of these things but in a more kind of like corporate strategy or like you know pitching or um like if you were to do kind of more terrestrial stuff or radio or tv things like that there are certain ways you're supposed to be able to do stuff and the more ways you can practice now um the better it's going to be when you need to, you know, d dip into that tool set, you know, and better to kind of practice it now and be like, ah, I've done this before. I know how to do this. I'm just going to use those techniques that Julia told me, and then I'm going to smash this pitch, blah, blah, blah. And then off you go, you know, and it's not like learning from scratch at a really critical moment, which is always the worst. No one needs that. Is um, that something that you would um, like to teach younger version of yourself then? Something that you, you would say, oh, if I'd known this, you know, like 10, 15 years Oh my God, it would be like a, oh my God, it'd be like a four hour nonstop talk. Because there was no one really doing specifically what I was doing. There was no one really to ask advice with, um, or like, what am I doing? Am I learning this in the right way? Is this how... All of this stuff has literally just been trial by fire of me just being like, well, I think that's probably... a right way of doing it I guess I don't know and just trying it out and sort of seeing what worked for me because I remember I got really fixated 
I, mean, I was talking about perfectionism before. I got really fixated earlier on in my career with making like the perfect like opening piece to camera. And it had to be perfect. And I got fully all tangled in my head about words and rhythm and like that weird TV presenter way of like talking about things. And you kind of talk in this like weird tone because that's how they always did it on TV. And it just looked mental. But that's how I thought I was supposed to do it. Cause I was looking at what people did on TV. Uh, and I, it took me ages to get these pieces to camera. And everyone's like, what is wrong with you? Like what's going on? Um, and then I just let go. And I was like, actually, I don't want to be that kind of presenter. I sort of way kind of prefer kind of a more chatty, more kind of conversational style. I mean, unless it's like a final or something and then I'll go a bit punchy, but you know, but I was getting so fixated with it and got really tangled up in my head to the point where I just couldn't do them. Um, and then I was like, right, I'm not having this anymore. And that's when I basically was like, right, I'm just gonna do pieces to camera over and over and over again. And that's when I was like, right, I'm gonna write four bullet points down and then do a piece to camera, write four different bu bu bullet points down and then do a piece to camera, but then do that one again, but differently. Uh, and I just used to run that until I was like, actually, I do know how to do this. And as soon as I was like, hey, I know how to do this, suddenly I could just do it because it was just a mental block. I could always do it, right? But I didn't think that I could. And actually by practicing, you're showing yourself that you can. And then you can tell yourself, you've done this a thousand times before, don't be silly, just get on with it, come on. You know, and that's half of it. It's, um, most of this stuff is just psychosomatic. You've got the full tool, tool set there to, to go with, you know. Absolutely. Uh, and finally, because obviously I'm conscious of the time and everything mm. as well. Um, if any student wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Do you prefer everything through LinkedIn or do you want them to reach you on, you know, Twitter? Do you have a preferred platform? Um, yeah, you can hit me up on LinkedIn. I, I go on there off and on. So it might not be super um super fast in terms of response. Twitter's fine. I don't really go into Instagram DMs because they're a bit weird so twitter is maybe better um but if it's like a big thing you want to tell me about maybe i guess maybe linkedin's better just because then you can sort of lay it out a bit easier rather than twitter but yeah either or it's fine okay then well uh obviously i am conscious of your time um so if, if everyone in the chat could give me some claps or anything like that i'm not, <laughs> not sure how, not sure how we, how we run through this uh just to, just as a thank you I, I can see uh there are a lot of them uh going through but i'm hoping that you've all appreciated uh julia's time uh today julia if i can just ask that you stay around in the end of the call just because we've got a couple of uh things that we need sure. to run through with you uh but thank you very much folks for joining us today thank you very yeah, much yeah thank you i hope it was semi-useful <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>